All right, folks, we're back. Again, this is the Proof of Life video from the Brewing Academy. This is the part where I move around the camera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to test some functions and show you some functions that uh, require me to move the camera around. And then I'll, I'll, I'll find a fixed location. And we'll go with, from there to demonstrate some of the functions. So what I want to do right now is I want to power on the machine and show you, I'm going to start here, show you the RGB, the composites, and the S-Video. Now, you will notice that I have VBXE installed. And what I've done is, with Spartadosh, you can set up multiple configuration files, config.sys files. And you can read in the manual how to set that up. But I have it set up so that it will either do a default, it will do a no VBXE, or it will do a VBXE where it loads the SpartaDOS drivers for VBXE. The one with no VBXE gets a graphics 8 console system, so I can have some of the functions of the v VBXE without having it installed, and that allows me to test systems at various points in their assembly. One of the nice things about SpartaDOS is it's got, and VBXE, is it's got a thing called Sparta Commander, or SC. And if you type in SC right here, it's going to load a graphical interface for navigating your hard drive or even your floppy drive. You will notice, however, that when you engage the VBXE, the other screens go blank. That is normal. Once I press Control Q, and yes, I really do want to quit, all the screens go back to normal again. All right? Now, something about the conventions here. You will notice that it's got that prompt there. If I show you my auto exec file, So I've got the prompt set so that it does the drive, and then it puts the directory and a cravat. So what this is is the drive number or drive letter, and then it's got the path. So this always tells me what directory am I, I'm in. It also will always read the drive when I select it. So that tells me immediately if it's working. I've also got the day and time set for uh, American, just because it's easier to remember sometimes. It's not better. The rest of the world does day, month, year, which is the least significant to the most significant, but we're also not using the metric system, so whatever. It, right now, that's the least of our problems, so we'll just move on. So, what I've got here is it's set up to uh, do a number of things, but what I want to do right now is I want to demonstrate that the SIO works. So I've got uh, a floppy entered into the S drive and do a, do a very interesting thing. I'm going to put a new floppy into drive one. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to type. Format. Okay, and then do unit A. And we're going to do density is double density. Ooh. And we'll do 40 tracks double sided. So we've got 360K. And we're going to format the disk. Press return. Now, it says it can't run ultra, can't run high, but it will run normal speed. It will format the disk, and if we go down here, we can see the red indicator light that it's writing to that drive, and it will put in, look at that, a new disk. What I, and then I hit escape, goes back to E, but now I do a directory, ta-da! Now, I had previously formatted some disks, as you may have noticed from the indicator. I changed the volume name on test, so you can see it was different, test, no volume name. 
and then C gets us to the next test. So now we're going to test the printer. And as you can tell, the printer is hooked up to the back, just an industry standard cable, and this is an old 9-pin dot matrix. So I'm going to turn on BASIC, and then I'm going to load D3 uh, print test BASIC. Okay, and then I'm going to type run, and then I'm going to go down here, okay, move that a little bit, now I'm going to press enter, okay, and this is a test of the printer for it. Did it work? And then, just so you can see there's no hijinks involved, it's just a little simple for next loop, and the printer works. Okay? So, printer works. VBXE works, obviously, because we just ran a Sparta Commander. Next thing I'd like to do is I'm going to power off the machine. Well, actually, I'm going to go into the BIOS. And remember, Sparta DOS is a cartridge, right? And so you have to disable Sparta DOS in order to run the um, external cartridge or, or the cartridge port. There's also disks here with no DOS on them, so I'm going to uh, blank them out and. Okay, and I'm going to make sure that it's not highlighted, and then I'm going to turn this off, oh, and then save, profile one, power off the machine, plug in the cartridge with an SD card already loaded, okay, plugged in, power on, splash screen, Ta-da! We're going to space here. Okay, and I've, I've just got my joystick here, and then I'm going to set this down. Well, okay, Here's, I'm going to play it with, uh, yeah, with my teeth. All right. I didn't say I was good at it, plus I'm playing with my teeth. Up, down, left, right, fire, diagonal. Oh! Okay. Okay, so cartridge works. P. Cicchini. We're just going to take it out here. And we're going to take out the SD card so I don't send it along. And put that down there and then what are we going to do now I'm going to boot the machine and press help to get in and then I'm not going to re-enable Sparta DOS I am going to enable the graphical OS press boot okay now that looks very nice there doesn't it looks super nice in RGB uh, not so much in composite especially at 50 plus inches but I mean what would you expect from composite right now remember we had engaged mouse 2 there so this is a mouse this is just a PS2 mouse and ta -da. also if we go up to here and do profiler let's do down here so this OS, this GOS, doesn't do a lot right now, but FJC uh, 
Jonathan Halliday has done great things. I think the more we talk about this, and now that he's done with some other projects, maybe he's got a few moments to spend on this. Drop him a few dollars. The Brewing Academy always makes sure that he's compensated for every uh, Ultimate One Meg that goes out. We flash it with this firmware because it's the best firmware for the Ultimate One Meg out there. And we just think it's great. Okay, but, and it's also a nice way to demonstrate that the mouse is working beautifully. And we'll even click for you. Okay, all done. So we're going to press F12 again. And we're going to enable SpartaDOS. That automatically disables the graphical OS. And we're going to boot this. Okay, now. We're going to put you in a stable location here. Okay, and I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to turn the composite screen off, just because we don't have three video sources or three audio sources going. It's kind of annoying. Next thing I'm going to do, let's step through a couple of things. Sorry. So, this is the firmware for Ultimate One Meg and for the XLD. Uh, the manual tells you a whole heck of a lot about it, but I'll just run through the basics. Everything is done either by the arrow keys, they will change screens, or to change options, press Enter. You can have stock 64K, 320K Rambo, 576 Copy Shop, or the default for my builds is 1088 or 1 meg Rambo. This gives you 1 meg of system RAM that you can use for home brews, for various and sundry things. I leave it on stock XLOS 1.3. Um, I think this is the version that's got the fewest problems with it, and most software runs with it. You can play around with OSB, which is the 800 OS. This is a PAL version. It's not going to give you what you need to run PAL software, but you might sneak across the line with a couple of things. What it will let you do is play 400, 800 games that don't work with the XL OS. You can also run Altera, which is the operating system behind the emulator that you can find online. XEGS OS, which if you want this machine to emulate an XEGS, that'd be great. It's more for a stock Ultimate One Meg install. You can set it, um, but it's you have to place a jumper on the Ultimate One Meg, which means you'd have to disassemble the machine. I don't recommend it. You can have anything in this basic ROM, but what comes installed is the Basic C, which is the most bug-free version, Altera Basic. Atari Assembler Editor, or CineAssembler. Both of those last two allow you to code for 6502 machine assembly. I leave it for basic. The basic state is whether or not you need to use option to turn basic off or leave it on. If you want to use option to turn it off, then it's at default. If you always want it disabled, there we go. XEGS ROM is only active if the XEGS mode is activated and the jumper is on the Ultimate One Meg. SpartaDOS is enabled. Graphical OS we've already talked about. Boot to loader means that you never want to go to DOS. That you're, well, that you want to go to the loader more often than you're ever going to go to SpartaDOS. And the loader, which we'll get to in a second, allows you to load ATRs, XEX files, and various things like that. 8K cart ROM you want enabled to make sure that you can run 8K carts through the cartridge port. The time and date you can set here, but it's very painful. Do it at the command line on SpartaDOS just by typing date and then a dialog. Well, not dialog because it's not a dialog box, but a way to enter the date will pop up. Same with time. All right, your stereo pokey is enabled. Again, you can disable it or enable it. VBX eBase, if there's something that's conflicting, you can change the address for VBXE. 640 is the default, so we're going to leave it there. GTI vGate, like we've said before, uh, 
does the cutoff for overscan so that you're not seeing overscan on monitors. PBI BIOS, your parallel bus interface needs to be enabled for any of the hard drives to work. Uh, your device is set for two, we're going to change that to zero. <coughs> it was set to two because there was, when I was testing another machine, um, it, this Ultimate One Meg was set with a Rapidus installed. Um, we're going to set it to zero just to make sure you don't have any problems. Like I said, boot drive is D5, Config S is D5. Uh, if you want the hard drive to always be locked, and if you want to enable a key to refresh it so you can hot swap compact flash disks or cards, that's up to you. Slave drive always needs to be enabled because there is two drives in here. You want to make sure that's going to happen. High speed I.O. is set up for uh, the SIO chain. If you have an SIO to Bluetooth, you could do high speed I.O. for that or disable it altogether. Uh, this is set up to do physical disks as well as uh, an SIO to PC, also called a PC link. I like sound to come off anything that's being accessed that is a drive. So hard drive, ATR, because it's just basically an emulated floppy, or anything coming through the physical SIO port. This is your information screen. Tells you that the BIOS was done in 2020, so it's the most recent version, 3.10. Um, this is an XLXE, set up as 6502. It's an NTX, NTSC machine, and VBX is, uh, the VBXE is present, as well as stereo. BIOS menu is accessed by pressing help and reset, or help upon boot, or if you get to the splash screen, you can press help, or F12. F12 is coded because we are using MyTex TK2OS to drive the keyboard. Cold boots disabled. If you want to enable it, just press enter and hold select when you boot or disable it. You see the BIOS logo at boot. You can flash the ROM on the U1M or any other ROM attached to the machine. It's enabled. You just need to be careful like you would normally be careful. Joystick disabled does not mean the joystick is disabled. It means that using the joystick to navigate these menus is disabled. And the reason why I disable that is because since I have a mouse attached to the machine and the mouse port turned on, if I went to enable it right now and enabled mouse port 1, or for example, let's do port 2, it's going to go nuts, isn't it? Why is it going nuts? Because I've got a mouse attached to it and it's thinking, okay, well, the mouse is attached. Since the mouse is always going to be attached, I tend to leave it off, okay? And let's put mouse port back to port 2. There we go. Sound is enabled for these menus. Screen savers enabled if there is an idle in these menus. This is to control the Rapidus, which is not installed on this machine. All of these keys can be pressed at any time on any screen, and it will do what it needs to do. Right now, I'm going to Save Changes, and I'm going to boot the loader. So S and then L. So here we have with the loader. And I'm going to show you one thing here with the loader. And that's how to access. So there's a lot of files out there like Seven Cities of Gold or this uh, demo, Possum in Terrace. And they're multiple disks. Well, how do you tell a machine that's emulating ATRs that it's got when it needs to move to the next disk? We create a map file, and that's what we're going to do here. We're going to load this map. And uh, we're going to press start. And as you can see, it's loading the first drive. OK, well, how do we insert site 2? In this case, we press Alt-N and then Enter. This is in the manual, but it's a very important thing to remember. This is how you load multiple disk games. This, and this is just a little demo that was created, and it goes on for a while. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back to the loader here and show you something. So D1 and D2 are already loaded with an ATR. 
Since we have something that can give us drive 1 and drive 2, for example, the uh, S drive, those are going to be in conflict. And we want... Alright, as we said in the text, um, camera showed itself off, so we're going to restart this and hopefully pick up where we walked off, left off. Um, turn that down just a hair. So when we left off, we were talking about uh, the fact that when you load something into the loader, especially ATRs, uh, it's going to designate itself as a drive. And if you have something else, either a physical disk drive or an S drive or an SIO to PC or whatever, those are going to be in conflict. And so you're going to get some odd readings when you access them. So make sure that you unload the ATRs from the drives on the loader so that doesn't happen. Alternatively, you could cold boot it and power cycle it, but that's a more finessed way of taking care of it. Now, the next thing I want to show you is since we've got the MIDI player on and I'm going to demonstrate one of the ways that the MIDI player works here. Because we've done just about everything else. We've done the joysticks, we've done the compact flash, we've done the mouse, we've done the keyboard, we've done the printer port, we've done the SIO, we've done the cartridge port. So let's do the MIDI and then we'll do the Wi-Fi and we should be done. So MIDI, I've got some things set up here and I'm just going to change to my MIDI directory and what I've got here is just some MIDI files uh, that came with a program called MIDI Play XEX. It's public domain or shareware out there and you can find it on the internet and I'm going to load it up the X command unloads the cartridge from the computer. You can read that about that in the SpartaDOS manual. Now, while we're waiting for this, the SpartaDOS manual is not included. It's something that you should download and certainly should familiarize with it. Um, it is hundreds of pages of different functions in the DOS because SpartaDOS is a very powerful, powerful DOS and it's something that you should familiarize yourself with because there is so much at your fingertips that I think a lot of people don't use. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to uh, press the file key and we're going to uh, access, uh, we're going to um, get a file here and we're going to go 001.mid and then we're going to load with the L. It's going to access the drive. And we can tell the RAM changes. And then we're going, now, I can't play a lot of this because YouTube will uh, scan it and say there's a copyright violation. Whatever. But I'm going to play it. Let's crank this up just a hair here. Okay, all the way up. I'm going to play and then pause it. Yeah, now, if, uh, you know, you are a human being that has been to a movie within the last uh, 40 years, 40, no, 30, 30 years, oh my god, 30 years, uh, obviously you probably haven't been to the movies in the last six months or so, ah, COVID, um, but you recognize that as don't you, don't you forget about me. And is from the Breakfast Club, and it can it plays the whole song. There are many other, you know, we could. And I can't keep playing it because, again, YouTube will go nuts. But very simple, easy way to do that, right? Now, the thing that I want to do now is I want to demonstrate to you the Wi-Fi modem, and I'm just gonna actually, you know, what we're gonna do? We're gonna load it. From the loader. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn motor control on, which is the uh, left hand switch, and it goes from MIDI to off to Wi Fi. And then I'm going to load up Bob Term. Now, 
It's set for default to Atari. We want to change it to ASCII. It's at 1200 baud, so we're good for that. And then we are going to press return to access the modem directly. I'm going to press AT plus config. This gives us a main menu. Now, this is the main menu that is in the firmware on the modem. All of this is detailed in the manual, so there's nothing to, to worry about there. But let's make sure that the Wi-Fi function is working, because we know the device is working, but actually is it scanning for Wi-Fi? We're going to type in Wi-Fi. And these are all the Wi-Fi networks that you can see around the Brewing Academy's uh, shop. Um, uh, Tippy EXT is something that I uh, access to program the TI Tippy, which is a TI Raspberry Pi interface device. Um, so it's not just Atari's here at the Brewing Academy. And the rest are some public networks that float around here around the Brewing Academy in Woodland. So with that, uh, there's not, you can use this to connect to one of these networks. You can use it to uh, go on the internets to access different BBSs. It's really nice because normally you have to have a, like a Landtronics connected or something like that. This makes it all in one. So we've gone over everything with the 1088 XLD. Again, this unit had the IO mod system installed. It's got Stereo Pokey. It's got the Ultimate One Meg. It's got VBXE. It's got Wi-Fi modem. It's got a cartridge port. It's got compact flash and parallel port and ISIO, everything works. So we're going to button this back up, we're going to put it in the box, and we're going to ship it off to the customer, and I hope she or he is very happy with their machine. If you are the customer, again, I hope you're ha happy, and if you're not the customer, I hope you enjoyed this demonstration of the 1088 XLD's capabilities. My apologies for the break in the film, cameras are persnickety and I, I did order a tripod so hopefully next time we'll set up a tripod and it will be straight on and we won't have this many difficulties I have changed the last couple of videos are no, no longer the phone so that's a plus but again we're always works in progress always works in progress if you keep moving and improving then things are going to go well right sure let's go with that all right with that it is uh, Sunday evening, or late afternoon, and we are done. We're going to finesse this video. Okay, we're, we're not going to finesse it. I, I'm just going to put it in and, and upload it. And If people like it, great. And when I get better at this, uh, the videos will get better. Anyways, talk to you later. I'm just rambling now. Bye-bye.